Thanks for staying up later. John Sales is with us tonight, and we joke about people that are called singer, songwriters, actor, slash screenwriter. You got a lot mm. of slashes. Yeah, I'm a hyphenate. Novelist, screenwriter, actor, director. Mm -hmm. Eight Men Out, for those of you who, uh, who might not know, in return of the Secaucus 7, Brother from Another Planet, and his latest, uh, City of Hope, has opened in a few cities and opens nationwide at the end of October. Do you pride yourself in your outsider status, or is it more or less just a, a fact of life and not something that you wear on your sleeve? Yeah, I think it's pretty much a fact. I think, you know, I have a lot of friends who uh, work for Hollywood studios, and uh, they often say, oh, geez, I really liked your movie. I wish we could make something like that. Um, so it's not that big a deal. It's just, you know, what you try to do is, is make a movie for an appropriate budget. And, uh, you know, people say, what would you do if you had $40 million? And I usually say, well, I cut it into eight pieces and make eight $5 million movies or 10 movies, you know, out of that. It's, it doesn't do you any good to have a $40 million budget if you have a $3 million subject. Um, and that can really saddle you with a lot of responsibilities that you don't want to have to honor. You made Return of the Secaucus 7, which was the breakthrough for you, mm -hmm. on what, sixty, seventy thousand dollars 70000 $60,000, yeah. And how long ago was that, about 15 years ago? That was about um, 12 years ago. Now, how much better could that film have been? Without changing the, the essence of it, how much better could it have been if you had $500,000 instead of sixty? Um, it would have been shot in 35 millimeter instead of 16, so it would have been a little sharper. Um, really what probably would have been better is I would have gotten more sleep. Um, but the, the things that money buys wouldn't have made it that much better. Um, if I had had a little more experience when I made it, um, I would have been able to do a few things that now looking at it I would have liked to have done. But um, money doesn't buy experience, time does. In uh, Return of the Secaucus 7, uh, there's this group of idealistic young people. They decide to take part in a march on the Pentagon. They get arrested. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a seminal moment in all their lives. Mm -hmm. They split up, as people do. They get back together some years later for a reunion, and mm -hmm. you know, it follows the changes in their lives and what can be rekindled of their past relationships mm -hmm. and, and what's lost. And knowing that that was the plot, Mm -hmm. A lot of people looked at the big chill and they said, this is a complete ripoff of the Secaucus 7. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that way? No, actually, I thought the big chill was, uh, you know, more thoughtful than usual Hollywood movie. Um, the, the problem is that they're both in a very small genre. There's only about four or five movies in this one little weekend reunion genre. And, uh, you know, the big chill is called the big chill for a reason. It's about people who are discovering that they've lost their ideals or maybe never had them in the first place. Whereas Return of the Secaucus 7 is about people who are coming back to recharge their batteries and are very much keeping their ideals and struggling to keep those ideals. So it's kind of like you can make a movie about Jesse James where he's a, you know, lying little scoundrel who sells his, you know, partners out. Or you can make one where he's just this good old country boy who's forced into a life of crime by the bad railroad people. And they're both movies about Jesse James, and they're going to have horses and guns and railroad trains in them. But they can be about very, very different things. I read somewhere where you said everything you do in one way or another is about community. Mm -hmm either found or lost, being searched for. Mm -hmm. Can you explain? Well, I think, you know, America is a place where uh, we haven't had much of a traditional culture. People came here at a time in the evolution of man. They came here with these kind of endless horizons at first, where you, if you didn't like what was going on, if you were the low man on a totem pole somewhere, you could just pull up stakes and go somewhere else. And what that's meant is that we haven't had too much traditional culture where you know, if your father was a peasant on the land and his grandfather was and his grandfather was and his grandfather was, where you have this kind of cyclical culture mm -hmm. and you always know your place within it. When you, when you have that kind of culture where you don't know where you are, you tend to try to find community wherever you can. Um, it may be in the Moonies. It may be in a political organization. It may be in a biker gang. It may be as a, you know, a Raiders fan. Um, people try to find, it may be, I'm a heavy metal person, I'm a headbanger, you know, or I'm, I'm somebody who gets into rap music. Sure. People try to find those communities. And that's something I've always found very fascinating about America is that within a geographical community, there can be a half dozen other communities. 
You know, you go to a certain town and there may be the hard shell Baptists and then there may also be the guys who go to the stock car races. Um, and they're very, very tight little communities, even though they may live next door to each other, they may not have anything to do with each other except that geography. Another movie of yours that I liked was uh, Brother from Another Planet. This is a strange movie. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that most people haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not exactly the biggest movie mm -hmm. that was ever made. And Brother from Another Planet actually has caught up with a lot of people on video. It's a very, very popular video title. It's been on uh, HBO or Showtime a couple times. And so we continue um, to, uh, you know, run into people. Joe Morton's always running into people. He played the main character in it, who just kind of give him one of these looks and say, you're the brother from another planet, you know. Um, and that was, I think, the only movie that I ever got the idea for from Dreams. Um, I was uh, working on the, um, the sound editing for Baby It's You and under a lot of pressure because it's a very expensive part of the process. And I first had a dream that I was hired to, um, to write a low-budget um, science fiction movie that Joe Dante was going to direct called Assholes from Outer Space which was you know, <laughs> kind of 3D title that would come out. And there were these guys with antennas who came down and they became bureaucrats. They became like people who worked at the motor vehicle department and just, <laughs> they were a pain in the ass to work with. And then I had uh, a dream a couple nights later that I was directing a low budget movie called Bigfoot in the City, which kind of looked like Odd Man Out, except instead of an, a guy from the IRA hiding around the city, it was this Bigfoot who had wandered into Seattle and he was wounded and there was a lot of, <laughs> wetted down cobblestone streets. And I kept thinking, well, these are just kind of skits. You know, I couldn't make a movie out of them. And then the, um, I had a third dream that was actually about a black guy wandering around a black neighborhood, and he couldn't talk to anybody. He seemed very alone. And I realized the way you realize things in dream without them being articulated. Oh, he's from another planet. No wonder, you know, he can't talk to anybody. How alienated can you get? A true alien. And I kind of combined the three, the kind of, you know, comic aspect of the first one and then the kind of man who's being chased mm -hmm. of the second one and the basic idea of a, you know, a, a, a runaway slave from outer space who crash lands in Harlem um, from the third one and uh, made Brother from Another Planet. And, you know, obviously it's entertaining and it's, mm -hmm. it's funny in, in a lot of places, but there are also some places where this guy, who's anything but dumb, but mm -hmm. just isn't, isn't initiated in, yeah. in this society, innocently reflects to people how abrasive they are, how unfeeling they are, mm -hmm. how less human than this alien they are. Yeah, I think one of the, the valuable things about that character is um, because he was black, he was somebody who people in the community didn't act differently when he was around. So he was a good guide in that way. And because he was from another planet, he saw things that we take for granted. So when he saw people buying something at a store, what he sees is somebody hands somebody a piece of green paper and they give him food. Now, what is that? Now, we see that every time we you know, go by a store and somehow that doesn't make any sense to him. Who would you cite as your primary cinematic influences and literary influences? Well, for cinematic ones, I, I was watching movies for about 20 years before I even looked at the credits. You know, I knew what John Wayne looked like. Like and most so, of us. Yeah, why read his name? And I certainly didn't know who the directors of movies were or even that they were directed. I, I just kind of thought, you know, the cowboys got together and said, <laughs> okay, Slim, you fall off the horse and, and I'll shoot, um, which is probably how they were originally made, you know, back when they were in East Orange, New Jersey. Um, but I, I'd say so in that way that, that they were kind of the American directors who were making, you know, genre movies, whether they were westerns or detective movies or, you know, so that's John Ford and Howard Hawks mm -hmm. and those kind of guys. Um, and then later on, probably people like John Sturgis who made uh, The Great Escape and The um, oh, uh, Magnificent Seven. And then when I went to college, I started to see foreign movies with subtitles, which uh, weren't available to me, available to me as a kid. And, so I started watching Italian neorealist movies and Kurosawa movies. I mean, he's finally the guy who I think is the best combination of, you know, a good story and good picture and good sound and good acting. Um, and then the, the generation ahead of me of, of, you know, really interesting directors of Scorsese and Coppola and, you know, Phil Kaufman and just a, a lot of people have come together in movies and you can take something from all of those people. 
We roll on here with John Sayles. Like a lot of filmmakers, you got your start working for Roger Corman. Mm -hmm. And people laugh at some of these titles that they see on bad Saturday afternoon, like mm -hmm. horror festivals, mm -hmm. uh, these Roger Corman films. But apparently, he really understands the craft of filmmaking and chooses mm -hmm. for whatever personal reasons to do these low-budget things, but mm -hmm. does them very inventively, and a lot of mm -hmm. people have learned at his, at his feet. Yeah, I think the, the thing that I learned that was most important working for, for Roger was what is... Oh, what can you do with money and what can you do with just talent and inventiveness? And that uh, good acting doesn't need to cost money, uh, interesting way to tell a story doesn't need to cost money. The things that cost money are shooting a lot of footage, which usually means a lot of action-adventure stuff mm -hmm. is more expensive. Um, big sets, big crowds usually cost money. But um, he really was able to either direct or produce um, lots of movies that um, really paid off the way that a multi-million dollar movie would for a fraction of the budget. You were the screenwriter for a couple of his films, uh, mm -hmm. Alligator. Mm -hmm. And Actually, Piranha, I, right? I did Piranha, Battle Beyond the Stars, and Lady in Red with Roger. And then with kind of graduates of, of his um, company, I did Alligator and the Howling. Um, what, didn't Spielberg say that Piranha was the only thing that kind of spun off of Jaws that he thought mm -hmm. was worth a damn? Yeah, he, he said it, it's obviously a Jaws ripoff, but it's the best Jaws ripoff. So <laughs> he, he ended up hiring Joe Dante to do the Gremlins movies for him. I read somewhere where you said that you learned most of what you know about style from watching Roberto Clemente. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, the thing that I always admired about Clemente is that um, his style was never to hot dog. He was one of the most efficient players ever, and at the same time he was able to do things with style. He had his idiosyncra idiosyncrasies, you know, his weird batting things with his neck, yeah. the way he'd throw the ball in, he'd, sometimes he'd throw it in underhand, he'd make basket catches. But it was never just a hot dog. It was just part of his verve of playing the game. And so one of the things that I've taken from him is this ideal that, that, that style is possible, um, verve of some sort, and, and class is possible, and it can be efficient at the same time. Based on what you just said, I'm thinking of the last scene in Eight Men Out. Uh, you were the screenwriter and mm -hmm. also appeared in it. Obviously, it's based on Elliot Asenoff's book, which is mm -hmm. one of the best books about sports right. ever written, about the Black Sox scandal in 1919. But after these players have all been banned for life, mm -hmm. even though they were exonerated in court, Judge Landis bans them for life, mm -hmm. we pick up Joe Jackson playing in a semi-pro league someplace mm -hmm. in New Jersey. Yeah, it was actually Bogota, New Jersey, where, it's, where it actually happened. Yeah. And he hits a triple. Mm -hmm. And as he arrives at third base, the look of joy that overcomes him just in the playing of the game, despite every reason that he had to be bitter. Mm -hmm. uh, was, was that what research told you Jackson was like, or what your, your imagination told you he should be like? It was actually a combination. Um, you know, some, some of what the story was about, and I know that um, Bernard Malamud in The Natural was drawing partly on the Joe Jackson story, you know, for his main yeah. character, of Roy Hobbs. Um, was that idea that there is finally under the layers of all the hype and the money and everything like that just the joy in doing the thing. You see it with actors, you know, who, who have to, you know, go through all their public divorces and this and that and they're in 20 pictures that they didn't want to do because they have, you know, alimony or whatever to pay off and then finally they get a good part and there's some joy in what they do or a director or anybody who does that kind of performing thing. It may be a singer or, a, you know, a musician. Um, that there is all that other stuff that gets between you and that basic thing. Um, but if you're lucky, you can retain some joy in that basic thing. And also, I read enough stories about, um, you know, guys who when they were barnstorming in the minor leagues in the 50s would go down or late 40s and play against some, you know, uh, pickup team in South Carolina. And they'd say, see that old man over there? You know, he used to be Joe Jackson and he'd have this big belly and... You know, they'd th try to throw some inside uh, curveballs at him, and he'd whack them over the fence and run around grinning at him and say, just keep feeding me that stuff. That he still loved to play baseball into his 50s. Um, it was just something he liked to do, and he figured he would always do it, and if he got paid for it, great, yeah. and if he didn't, great. The new movie, City of Hope, will be open nationwide by the end of this month. Give us a rundown. Well, City of Hope is about uh, the people in a small city and uh, how they coexist, how they get along. Um, I've lived in 
all kinds of different cities, uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, to Albany, New York, to Hoboken, New Jersey, to East Boston, Massachusetts. And there's a similarity to that kind of melting pot politics. And a lot of it, I think, is about the hard decisions that we all make as to where our loyalties stand. Um, is our loyalty to the larger group and the good of the larger group, or to our ethnic group, our racial group, and in some cases, in, in small city politics, our family? Um, things cut across bloodlines fairly quickly. The, the main stories in City of Hope are about one character, played by Vincent Spano, who has kind of been born into the machine politics of the city. Uh, and he's trying to get out. He realizes that the, the responsibilities of that, the ties, the expectations of being in good with the mayor and being in good with the mob and being in good with the cops and all these things, even though there are rewards, are things that he didn't ask for. And so he's the character who's trying to get out of the system. And then uh, a black city councilman played by Joe Morton is the guy who's trying to get into the system. Um, his people are still a minority in this city. Um, and he's trying to get black people some power. They've, they've started to have the numbers where they deserve some power in the city, but they don't have it yet. And, and so there's this kind of tension of somebody trying to get into a system and realizing I could get corrupted very, very easily. Um, this is a difficult thing to walk between your personal ethics and what's good for your constituencies. And this other guy who's realizing geez, it's almost as hard to get out of this thing as it was for my father to get into it 20 years ago. Depending upon where you live, John Sayles' City of Hope may already be showing at a theater near you. For sure, it'll be open around the country by the end of October. Thanks a lot for coming by. Thank you. We enjoyed it. We're out of here. See you later.